Hey guys, Will here, and today we'll be building a 4K work editing station from a point of view perspective. The video will be split into three different parts. First, we'll be assembling all the hardware. The second, we'll be installing Windows operating system. And the last part will be installing all the drivers necessary for the hardware to work properly, and also testing it out on Adobe Premiere to see how it handles 4K footage. To get started the tools you'll need are a Stanley knife, a size 1 and 2 Phillips head screwdriver, a pair of side cutters, a magnetic tray, some velcro cable ties and normal zip ties. To set up an anti-static workspace, first open up the power supply. Switch it to off and then plug in the power cable. And to remove any static electricity built up in the body, you simply place your hand on the power supply. Another way to prevent static electricity is to not build a PC in a carpeted room. Stick to a wooden or tiled floor, but if you can't help that, setting up a static safe work environment is the next best call. Next start with your motherboard. My main goal was to build a 4K editing station without spending any money on any unnecessary components. To begin with, we're going to remove the anti-static wrapping from the motherboard. And we're actually going to use the motherboard box as a test bench. It keeps the debris away from the board that might be on your work surface, and it's also an alternative to one of those anti-static mats that you can use. Set the I.O. shield aside for later. When handling the motherboard, try to only use its edges or plastic components when picking it up or moving it around. This prevents getting the oil from your hands on any of the circuitry. For this build, the CPU I chose was the AMD Ryzen 5 2600. It has six cores, which is enough to handle 4K editing, and its base clock speed is 3.4 gigahertz, and it can boost up to 3.9 gigahertz. Take your CPU out of its packaging and take note where the golden triangle on the lower left side of the CPU is. This triangle lines up with the triangle on the processor's socket. Turn the CPU to match the two triangles up when installing. Lift the metal arm on the CPU socket out and all the way up. Pick the CPU up from its sides and be careful not to touch the main body of the CPU or the pins underneath. Lower the processor into the socket and it shouldn't take any force to drop it in. If it does, the orientation is incorrect or the metal arm hasn't been raised. Once it's dropped into place, give it a bit of a wiggle side to side to make sure it's in and lower the metal arm back into place. And now the CPU is installed. For our memory, I've gone with a nice low latency DDR4 3000 kit from Corsair. I went with 16 gigs of RAM in an eight gig by two configuration. This allows for dual channel operation for better performance and gives us plenty of expansion for the future. So I can go up to 32 gigs with no problems. To start with, unlock the tabs for the motherboard RAM slots. On more modern boards, you can only move one of these outward, but with the B450, both need to be pulled out to allow the RAM to be fitted. When lining the memory, carefully check the position of the notch. So you can see here that I need to flip this around in order for it to fit in the slot correctly. And apply even pressure to both sides of the memory stick and push down until the tabs are locked back into place. You'll hear it click. The RAM slots are actually numbered on the side of the motherboard to make sure that you put them in the correct slots. Now it's time to install the N.2 SSD. I'm using a 250 gig 970 from Samsung, but the instructions are the same regardless. It's a good idea to ground yourself out now and again just to make sure no static electricity is built up. 
especially when handling components such as this. First find the N.2 slot on your motherboard, this is it here. Hold the SSD up against it to see which mounting post is going to be suitable. We have to remove the screw from the mounting post that's already installed on the motherboard in order to install the SSD. The size screw is normally a size 1. The standard is size 2 so just make sure you take note of that. You won't need a lot of force when installing your SSD. Hand tight is fine. As for the drive itself, it installs like a laptop memory. So you go up at an angle, push it into the slot. And then you just hold it down in place while you're screwing the screw back into the standoff. Now let's turn our attention to cooling. AMD processors come with a heatsink and fan in the box and also come from factory with thermal compound already applied, which ensures proper heat transfer to keep your CPU cool. So that's the thermal compound that's already applied to the heatsink, so no need to put any additional thermal compound on the CPU. First, remove the brackets that came already fitted to the motherboard. The cooler screws directly to the motherboard, so you won't need these. The backing plate won't be removed. We will use this to screw the cooler into, so it can stay in place. When you're fitting the heatsink, first make sure that where the cable is coming out for the fan is somewhat close to the CPU fan connector on the motherboard. In this case, it's this one right here. The screws are spring loaded, so you do need to apply some pressure as you're screwing them in to get started on the thread. I recommend getting all four started first, then tightening down evenly so that there's equal pressure onto the CPU. You don't want uneven contact, so tighten them down until they're firm. You can't actually over tighten these screws because of the spring. When they're tight enough, they'll just stop, so you won't be able to tighten them any further. Once it's tightened down, it's time to plug in the CPU fan. The CPU fan header is right here, which is nice and close. So shorten the cable, you can tie a loop in the cable before you plug it in and this reduces the cable length just enough so that there's a clean run to the CPU fan connector. Be sure to line up the locator here with the tab on the CPU fan plug. As you're going, it pays to package back up the boxes and put them aside away from your work area to keep it nice and tidy. The case I decided to go with is the NZXT H10i mid tower case. First off, I'm just going to remove the front and rear panels. The rear panel comes off by removing the two thumb screws at the rear and swinging the panel out towards the front and it pops straight off. Straight back into the box with this one and I usually use a foam divider to separate the rear case and front glass panel just to prevent it from scratching. The front panel is made out of tempered glass but it does scratch very easily. To remove the front panel there's just one thumb screw, the glass sits down into the bottom of the case and there's two locators at the top. So you pull the glass out from the top and lift up. Next flip the case onto its side getting it ready to put the motherboard in.
We're going to grab the IO shield that we put down before and install that before putting in the motherboard. It fits down here. The little round nubs on the IO shield face outwards when installing. As a sanity check, put the IO shield over the motherboard ports to make sure that they all enter through the IO shield without any resistance. Now we install it in the back of the case by lining it up and then pressing down on each corner until it snaps into place. The last thing we need to check is if the right standoffs are installed inside the case to fit our motherboard. These are actually quite good, there's 9 here in place, but unfortunately they don't quite match up with the micro ATX form factor of our motherboard. We need to remove the top and bottom outer standoffs and move the middle one over one hole. To do that, grab some long nose pliers and unscrew the standoffs to reposition them into the right spots. To double check that the motherboard will fit properly, pick it up by either its edges, plastic connectors or back plates. I really like to hold onto the CPU cooler because assuming that you've got one with a pretty good mounting mechanism, they're really secure and you can get a good handhold on it as well. As you lower the board, I like to have it at about a 15 degree angle as I'm sliding it towards the back of the case. Now that we've repositioned the motherboard, we're going to use that little locating standoff to hold it in place and look through every hole to make sure that we can see exactly the right number of standoffs that we're expecting to see. I can see that each mounting hole has a corresponding standoff, so now we can go ahead and screw the board in. Motherboard screws and any additional screws and standoffs are all included in the hardware that comes with your case. We're gonna be using the 632 button heads you see right here. If you're not sure if you've got the right screw, try hand threading them into the mounting standoffs. If they go in easily, it's likely they're correct, but if they're really hard to screw in, definitely try a different screw to prevent cross threading. When tightening these, just keep in mind not to over tighten them. Once you start to meet resistance, give it another 1 8 of a turn and that's all they need. Although it seems like there's a lot of cables, you can put them into three main groups. The cables for the power supply that powers motherboard and graphics card, the case cables which connect the ports and buttons on the top of the case to the motherboard, and the fan cables which connect to the motherboard also. Starting with the front case cables, there's the front panel connector, HD audio connector and USB 3.0 connector. There's also a connector for USB-C, but unfortunately the motherboard doesn't have any support for this. First, we're gonna connect the HD audio, feed through the other front case cables. The connector for the HD audio is in the bottom left of the motherboard. Next up is the connector for the USB 3.0 port on the front case panel. Because it's quite close to the edge of the motherboard, I'm just gonna route it through the side to make sure there's enough slack in the cable. The pins for the USB 3.0 are very fine, so make sure when you're connecting it that you get it square as you push it in. Lastly, there's a plug for the front panel. In order to split it into individual pins to suit the motherboard, you just connect it to this splitter cable. If you pull out the motherboard manual, it tells you very clearly whereabouts each of these pins need to be installed. Starting off with the power LEDs for the power switch. As a general rule of thumb, the positive pin is generally the one on the left. Next up is the power switch itself. And then lastly, the hard drive LED, which sits underneath the power LEDs for the power switch. Time to install the fan connectors for the upper case fan and rear case fan. <laughs> 
the rear case fan I found you can make a straight run down to the connector on the motherboard at the back here and the top case fan there's a connector right next to the RAM now since we're done handling most of the ESD sensitive components of our build we can go ahead and install our power supply now all the cables required are usually stored in one of these bags we'll be using three cables in total two for the motherboard and one for the graphics card you can unplug the power supply from the power point and we'll start by plugging in the cables we need the first one will be a 24 pin plug for the ATX power supply to the motherboard and just make sure to line up the locator with the top when you're pushing the plug in the second cable is a 6 pin ATX cable as well next up we've got our 8 pin EPS connector you can tell the difference between this one and an 8 pin PCIe Express connector in a couple of ways one is that if it splits apart it will split into 4 and 4 instead of 6 and 2 and the second way is that many PCIe Express connectors actually have the gap between two of the pins bridged. Here you can tell these still have a gap because it's a 6 and 2. Also they helpfully label them CPU so this one goes right up to the top of the motherboard. For PCI Express the type of cables you're going to use will depend on your graphics card. I'm using a GTX 1660 that has an 8 pin power connector. The PCI Express connector also has this split plug design and you have to make sure to put the split part of the plug in front of the 6 pin part. That way it can't come undone. I'm going to go fan side down because this case has a lot of space on the underside to draw in air. Now as we're putting it in we can place it down, push towards the motherboard and then slide into the back of the case. Then using the 632 screws we're going to secure the power supply to the mounting holes. Make sure you don't put the case on carpet because there won't be any air being drawn in from underneath. If you do have carpeted floors you can just leave it mounted on your desk as well. I'm starting by routing all the cables through to the motherboard and then once they're in the right locations I can then continue by securing all the cables down. This is really important because if they're not secured properly you're going to have a really rough time trying to fit the side cover back onto the case. The good thing about NZXT cases is they have a lot of wire routing options including these channels for the thicker wires and loops to secure zip ties to hold the wires in place and neat and tidy. So I've routed the two main power cables for the motherboard and now I'm just routing the PCI Express cable in preparation for the graphics card. So this 24 pin cable goes into the side of the motherboard here and it is important that you get it lined up correctly. There's a clip that holds it in place and when you push it in sometimes you need to support the back of the motherboard as you're pushing it to make sure the motherboard doesn't flex too much. And once you hear a click it's in place properly. Also plug in the CPU power cable. It pays to double check that this is the correct end of the cable as well. It should have it labelled CPU on the plug itself. Next up is the graphics card installation. We'll start by taking out the second and third from the top PCI slot covers that sit below the 16X slot where the graphics card will be mounted. To fit this graphics card in there's also a sliding plate on the back of the case that needs to be loosened and slid across to enable the graphics card to fit in properly. Now we can prepare the slot by moving the tab back Remove the rubber protective boots from the ports on the graphics card. I find it easier to line up the I.O. first and check to see if it's aligned at the rear of the case. Making sure that the tabs are inside the case instead of outside, otherwise it won't fit properly. Once it looks aligned, switch back to this side and look down through the gaps and you'll notice the holes. Looks good to me, push down with even pressure until you hear a click. And that's it. If the tab locks back into place, which it seems that it has, then it's installed. Reinstall the PCI slot cover screws straight into the graphics card to hold it in place. And slide the cover back across and tighten those screws as well. Now we'll go ahead and connect the PCI Express connector to power the graphics card. Using one of these Velcro cable ties, we can tidy up the cables and keep them together. It makes it look a little bit more neat as well. I'm actually going to use two here 
one near the graphics card and one back a bit further to make sure that that extra plug is kept in place. It's fairly standard to find disposable cable ties like these in the packaging for your power supply or your case. But if you want to bind larger bundles of cables together, I'd recommend getting some Velcro ties like these. It's also really great when the cases include loops for wire management. It costs them basically nothing to implement and it really makes a big difference when you're trying to secure all the wires nice and neatly. To achieve a decent cable management job, your main focus is to make sure that no wires are crossing over each other and they're all flat against the back of the case. I found that the plastic channels on the back of the case made it a much easier option to run the thicker cables, keeping them flat so that the side panel can be refitted properly. With the cable management job done, it's now time to refit the rear case panel. Line it up with the three locators first and then swing the case panel back into place and screw it down. And now reinstall the front glass panel. Slotting the glass down into the base first and then pushing the locators into the top and tightening down the thumb screw. Now that we've got this installed, we're close to booting it up for the very first time. Plug in the power cable, switch the power supply on. We'll plug in our monitor, mouse, keyboard and network cable and we're ready to push the power button. Upon first startup, hitting the delete key repeatedly will enter BIOS. This will allow us to see all the components are showing up and we can change our memory speed because as standard it will default to a slower speed. Once at the BIOS screen, open advanced memory settings and straight away you can see the memory frequency is only running at 2100 MHz. To change it to our faster rated speed, select Extreme Memory Profile or XMP and select Profile 1. Straight away you can see the speed has changed to 3000 MHz, so all there's left to do is save and exit and from there install Windows. I've created a Windows boot USB drive to be installed and also purchased a copy of Windows, so I'll go ahead and plug that in. When it loads into Windows Setup, you enter the product key if you have a licensed version and just follow the prompts to install Windows. Once Windows is installed and you're connected to the network, we then need to install the drivers for the motherboard, LAN Ethernet, audio, graphics card, and in this case, I'll be using a wireless USB adapter, so I'll be needing drivers for that as well. This motherboard doesn't come with a wireless card standard, so that's the reason for going with the USB wireless option here. You can download each driver from the manufacturer's website and just save them to your desktop. Unzip each folder and load the setup and complete each install procedure, which is pretty straightforward, especially if you choose the express install option. After installing the driver, delete the files from the desktop. Instead of restarting the computer after each driver install, just restart it right at the end. That way you can save some time. I went with this Wi-Fi adapter by Asus that is able to handle 4K streaming and is a good alternative to a Wi-Fi card you have to install to the motherboard. It just plugs straight into a USB port and now that we have our driver installed we can connect it straight to the Wi-Fi network. To stress test the CPU, I'm just running it through a render of Cinebench R20 to see how it performs. I was pretty happy with the score it got and the great thing about Cinebench is you can compare the score once you're done with other PC builds online. I also did the editing for this video on this PC as well and was impressed with how it handled 4K footage. Both scrubbing through the timeline and overall workflow was pretty great. All the parts I use in this build will be linked down in the description below. Make sure to leave this video a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe for more tech videos in the future. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.